Well, Maud Poe has come to the home of Jane Goldman. Jane, thank you so much for having us here. Welcome. We're very excited. And Ian Morrison has joined us. Ian, hi. Hi, great How to be here you? with you. Yes. Really good, thank you. And, and also, we have a person who's celebrating a birthday. We won't get into the details of it, but Leanne Brown, <laughs> who's here, who's, I suggested, was now halfway through, and she then modestly suggested two-thirds, which is still a very long life, and we're very happy to have you with us, Leanne. Thank you. Who cares so much about the Scottish poetry scene that she came to be with us here from New York slash North Carolina. Nothing I'd rather do. Poetry day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. That's right. And Lainey Brown Hello. is here. And Sophia <laughs> DuRose. And Ian put together or helped sponsor Women on the Road. And this is a pamphlet that coincided with this event. And essentially you are, I guess... Lainey is responsible for the curation of this choice, this gathering, and this poem. Um, and Ian is kind of co-curating it because you made this all possible. Well, that's very kind of you, but um, I'm just assisting from the, from the sidelines. Well, <laughs> okay, <laughs> central side. Yeah. And the poem that Jane wrote for this event was the poem, is the poem we're going to talk about. Americans say majolica, but in honor of the way majolica is said in the UK, we'll pronounce it that way. What if the majolica plate, and Jane's going to read it for us, if that's okay, and then we'll just talk about it. All Sounds right. great. Did you want to add anything to the scene here? Um, only to say, so um, this was uh, commissioned as part of an evening where six amazing poets uh, read within the exhibition of the Fruit Market Gallery. The artist that they were responding to was Emma Hart, who had a real thing about family spaces, including uh, you know rooms, but also uh, cars. So they were standing, if you imagine them, around the kind of runway of the exhibition space, encountered by the audience as they moved around the exhibition. So that's when I first encountered this work by Jane. Um, and I would say that I think in terms of its ambition, it far exceeds the initial commission. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, well, I should add that it was actually, it, it was underneath, uh, it wasn't the runway bit of the yeah. exhibition, it was the the actual kind of tea party looking teapots and cups yeah. that we were all, that were suspended from the ceiling and we were all standing under yeah. these ceramic things. Everything in the in the exhibition was ceramic. And you had the silhouettes of cutlery, giant cutlery revolving around in silhouette around your heads. It was quite... Uh, Scary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, psychodrama. Okay. Uh, what if the Majolica plate... What if the Majolica plate that is so firmly set in the wall of the dining room display and is posing itself so self-consciously in the sealed empire of objects, glazed as it has to be with opaque tin enamel, entirely concealing the colour of the clay body, the clay body entirely concealed, is not, after all, the problem, is not, after all, the origin of all our tea table oppressions, is not, after all, the negantropic source of all our woes, the very emblem of infinitely many muddled ways, the very ways that things will always go towards muddle and mixedness. What if a Majolica plate is as such the many muddled ways towards muddle and mixedness, and is in fact the precise information that is a difference, and a difference that is a relationship, a difference that is a change in the relationship, and a change in the relationship produced by its negantropic effect without the necessity of making a final intervention, without the necessity of giving up on tea table thinking, a tea table thinking that makes a happiness, a happiness that must think peace into existence. What if a Majolica plate has, after all, been conceived as a pot 
for a definite purpose and is striving towards a new mixedness of unity and spontaneity and simplicity of form and has in fact made itself as simple in its form as it has to be and is only as muddle patterned as it has to be to be itself enduring and full of quiet assurance emanating itself from myriad vital forces behind a clay body a clay body that is flowing through the processes of its own making as glazed as it wants to be with opaque tin enamel, entirely concealing the colours of the clay body, the clay body entirely concealed. What if a Majolica plate is a pot for a definite purpose, simply formed to cast a speech bubble? Thank you, Jane. Observations of any sort, out of order, any way you like. We'll start with Lainey and go to Ian next. What do you think, Lainey? Um, I just, I can't help thinking about Stein mm -hmm. so much in reading this, in the way that the meanings multiply, the repetitions, um, objects, rooms, food, intimate spaces, and the, when the difference that is a relationship, the difference, I just keep thinking about, the difference is spreading. spreading yes. <laughs> Perfect. Great start. Ian? For me, I was really struck on this reading with the comparison that's implicit in the poem between bodies that we live in and this clay, this clay that's heated up um, to, to take the pattern and the glaze. Um, and this word negantropic that keeps coming back about the loss of heat, I think, if I'm, if I'm right. And I was just thinking that I love the way that Jane's poem places the solution for all of the problems at the root of our own body, at the root of our own communities, gathered around a plate, sharing food together as we work out how to move in this world. That is wonderful. Oh, we're accumulating some great topics. Leanne? Yeah, I want to follow up on the clay as the body part. And I think that um, a, one part I love is the this repetition of the clay body entirely concealed. The second mention, it's in parentheses, and I think the parentheses remind me of the glaze. Mm, oh, I love that, parentheses. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sophia, what do you think? Um, I'm thinking about this muddle and mixedness um, and how we don't uh, like make things by accident, but we accumulate them by mm. this kind of contextualized chance of our daily lives mm. and what it means to accumulate within um, this like entropy, the muddledness and the mixedness mm. and what we decide is worth keeping through all of that. Well, we'll let Jane respond and take us in any direction. Having heard all these things, I'll just add two topics. Of course, the tea table oppressions, in the second section, the necessity of giving up on tea table thinking. Um, and we have this plate that's kind of uh, the aesthetic in place in the domestic space that kind of sponsors, affects, or, either, or maybe doesn't affect what happens at the tea table. That whole domestic arrangement is so interesting to me. And then the other thing I'll add, it's been implied here in the third section, Steinian, is this idea of composition, how things are compos composed, the making of the plate, what it's hiding, that in itself is instructive for a writer who's trying to compose. All right, you've got lots of things. <coughs> Keep up on any thank of you, Thank you all so much. Um, it, it, um, I think maybe if we start with negantropic, I, um, entropy is the, um, what is it, the, 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 the dissemination of enemy, it's the, is it the second law of thermodynamics? The um, measure of randomness in a system. Yeah, yeah. And, and the fact that uh, work is being depleted and energy is, is diminishing. Um, but negentropy is the counter to that. Um, so it, it, it means um, the kind of pushback of pattern and, and, and form. 
things become more ordered rather than less. Yeah, and so some people think negentropy is actually belying the, the law of thermodynamics that um, insists on entropy. But what interests me was the tension that is there in, in any arena between the two. And there are lots of ways in which that could be said to be the kind of site of producing and proliferating difference in a way that refuses to be binary. Yet the poem is trying to set up, I think, um, what are the differences between what are perceived to be two mm. different schools mm -hmm. of ceramics? So there's a kind of tension there. So, um, yeah, I, I think every time I read it, it, it the, I think Stein has really helped me with the syntax because it's about the fact that within the same continuum, you as a reader have to decide when it's negentropic and when it's being entropic, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whether it's... Um, dispensing and dispersing with energy and the work is slowing down you know there's a kind of labor uh, kind of argument going on here with that that trope of entropy um, and then you, you know so I think that the Steinian line really helped me to understand that within you know like wave particle theory that within the same continuum it can be there can be tension at any point depending on how you perform mm. the line Wow. Um, the phrase empire of objects is loaded because of the power of the word empire. Yeah. How would you like to, us as readers to think about, this is a tea table oppression, a scene of some tea table oppressions, either as domestic memories or otherwise, but we're in a sealed empire of objects. Is empire, is that imperium a bad thing? difficult thing. I I don't know I mean it's up to you how you how you read it but I can tell you what I was thinking about and the kind of phrases that I was gathering as I was making the poem um, a lot of uh, this stuff not only comes from the difference between two schools of ceramic making uh, majolica peasant wear um, and uh, the kind of simple uh, minimalist tradition to, to pottery that was made famous in the 20th century by um, Bernard Leach. Um, we can we can have a look. Shall at we pass along? Do you, want, do you want to see the Bernard Leach? That I was brought up in a household. My dad was a potter, Bob Goldman, and Bernard Leach. This he was lucky enough once in his life to go to a workshop with the famous Bernard Leach who was down in Cornwall and had a, a studio there and he's, uh, he, my dad's dead now but he um, left a label on this so that we'd understand this was by Bernard Leach. So you can see how, how simple that is. It's like the least you interfere with the form mm. um, to make it, I don't know, pure, functional, beautiful, whatever. And, and there I've got some examples of my dad's own pots. So I, I you grew up. Want to pick one up, Lainey? Yeah, do you want to have... So again, it's to do with how you place the glaze in relation to the, the pot. You know, the most minimal gesture, but it has to be, you know, it's about judgment and force and, and restraint. And um, mm. yeah, so these are examples kind of after Bernard Leach. That so would is be... this the new mixedness you admire? I I don't. When you say I admire, I well, admire the speak, both. Well, the speaker of the poem, <laughs> I I think striving the, towards a new mixedness of unity and spontaneity and simplicity of form. Yeah, what I'm asking is maybe it becomes clearer, I suppose, or what the poem is asking, and what I asked myself when I was writing the poem is if this is a kind of basic example of it's uh, Majolica is peasant wear, which is is kind of red earthenware. You can see the and it, it uses tin enamel or glaze to entirely cover the clay <laughs> to make it look something it... To make it look a little fancier yeah. than it really is. Yeah. So you can see how, for Bernard Leach, that is like, <laughs> you know, not. This is covering <laughs> over the Bernard, Bernard Leach. Yeah, I suppose you could say that in the, in the simplest form. Now, the woman whose exhibition it was, Emma Hart, had made like upstairs was this racetrack and it was like bits of cars and it was all made of clay <laughs> and glazed or painted or whatever 
And downstairs, the Mamma Mia bit, which this poem is responding to, was based on her residency in Italy, where she had a studio and she was being taught how to make Majolica by the European, you know, the, the centre of Majolica expertise. Um, so she's learning about this. And at the same time as she's learning about this, she's also attending this special family psychoanalytical group hmm. who are um, interested in the ways in which, uh, you, you a, a bit like R.D. Lang, you treat the whole family. Mm -hmm. So what are the patterns? What are the things that are going on laterally within a family and also horizontally be through, through generations? So she made these pots, these things that look like giant mm -hmm. teacups or, or um, uh, teapots that may or may not be able to pour and may not may or may not be functional even, but they're hanging suspended and they're large. And so I really understood what that was about um, in terms of saying how um, all of our politics comes down to being at the tea table. So the very fact that we even take tea, the very fact, you know, we're talking empire. As soon as you follow any of the products or, or the equipment that you have on your tea table, you're talking about empire and you're talking about a kind of Cartesian subject-object relation. <laughs> you're talking about a power relation. And, of course, as soon as I started thinking, tea table politics is, is from Virginia Woolf, mm. who was inducted as a young person in the Victorian era uh, right. to serve mm. tea. <laughs> so um, all of her work is about resisting that servitude and resisting participating in the empire of objects. So all of that was, I don't think that explains my poem, but it maybe gives you some of the sources for some of the phrases. Every time I read this poem, I think, yeah, where is the negentropy? Where is the entropy? Where is the, where is the myolica? And where is the kind of Bernard Le Leach purity, because mm -hmm. to me that is a, a kind of purity too. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a complexity. gave us the most extraordinary, we do this a lot, you know, mm -hmm. gather spontaneous close readings, but it's rare that, this is just a compliment, it's rare that <laughs> we're in the presence of the creator of the poem and we get, you just did it for us. <laughs> and I, it's remarkable what you just did. And I wonder if we can respond to anything that Jane ta just now taught us, even if it's a matter of going back to the poem to find a phrase or two that amplifies what she just said. Ian, you look like you have something to say in response <laughs> yeah, to Jane. I, I, so I guess there's a, there's a few things. I, I think in response to what Jane was saying just now, one of the things that I was interested in was ekphrasis within Jane's process and the way that perhaps a bit like the the, the, the glaze and, and the underneathness of the glaze. Yes. It's it, it's not writing. Yeah, it's not a surface thing. It becomes like shot through the whole yeah. the whole yeah. way through and, and Jane's yeah. ekphrasis like manages to kind of get deep inside what the exhibition might be doing materially, you, yes. you know, with, with with the clay and and reflects mm. it in in its form. So the I poem think. does what it's saying. Yeah, it does what it's saying. That's, cause, cause, that's that yeah. that explains the speech bubble at the end. Yeah, right. Something like that. And and then I'm I'm thinking with the form, yeah. these themselves are like heads. We have like three heads, and, yeah. the, and then yeah. the speech bubble. Yeah. that's yeah. remarkable. The, well, if you remember in the exhibition, mm -hmm. the shadow that was cast, the, the exhibition was beautifully lit. So you've got these incredibly colourful ceramics hanging from the ceiling, but also they were lit so that they cast shadows on the floor mm. and the shadow of the teapot became like a speech bubble yeah. mm -hmm. on the floor. Yeah. So um, okay. I, was, I was a member of, it, when Ian says there were six people responding, uh, this was part of um, a woman's collective of poets that I, I'm a member of that called 12, a collective of women's poets. So it, it's a very um, kind of womanly response to this as well. And it, what was really moving was 
you know, we shared these poems on the night. We did, we, we, we went off and we, we, we were together looking around the exhibition and then we did our separate research, but we didn't show each other our poems until the actual mm. night. Mm -hmm. And uh, this poem kicked off and then it went and we were all stood under a, you know, a different uh, kind of yeah. there, there are images in the ceramic. Maybe there's images yeah, I think there's yeah. one I want to show. Yeah. It was so moving that, yeah. you know, you know, for women to be doing this, mm -hmm. and no, I, in the speech bubbles, yeah, in like the speech poet. bubbles, yeah, yeah. yeah so that's uh, so there are three, there are two levels of meta art here, and one is of course the speech bubble that ends the poem that a reader might think is the poem as a speech bubble, and then of course there's the art exhibited, and then there's the domestic objects that create light and shadow. Wow, Leanne, what are you thinking? I'm thinking about how this poem is four questions, and the last one is the most condensed and simplified, and it says, what if, you, and you said, a majolica plate, mm. majolica plate, you changed it. It's the way Jane read it, yeah. Now she's mm. got it here in the book. Oh, it's there, and here it's the yeah. different poem. Oh, somebody's, but yeah, changed oh yeah, it. maybe this is because when it was yeah. republished in here, maybe I changed it to yeah, A. Yeah, I think you changed it. I think that might be the influence of, of Tom Leonard that I wanted to have that, uh, you know, you know um, Tom Leonard very helpfully says, a dictionary of uh. a English language, uh. you know, oh, cool. sort of, yeah. so, you, you know, getting away from the, mm -hmm. uh, so that's interesting. I must have, when it, when it came to being republished, I must have thought, mm. I want to have that. Not the empire of objects, but the empire of articles, the and a, uh, mm. yeah. according to yes. Tom. Is yes. it radicalism? It goes from the yeah. ecrastic yeah. of this particular sculpture to what yeah. if a plate, a yeah. certain plate, and then it gets, it's a pot for a definite purpose simply formed to cast a speech bubble. And I, I read that as like, what if the body is just here to make language? Mm. That's, what I, mm. that's what I felt that was saying. Yeah. Like, Who wants what, to respond yeah. to this <laughs> tantalizing phrase, all, all the origin of our troubles source of all our woes. The poem is not saying that I know, I, the speaker, know the source of all our woes, but when you read that, you think, oh, I really want to explore this to see if there is, <laughs> can a poet deliver? Who else is thinking about that? And if so, what do we do with that temptation? Lainey, I'm looking at you, <laughs> even though you're looking down and I don't want to deal with this. Okay, but, please. Um, I'm thinking about how the, the vessels hanging are like you know human heads that are severed right they're mm. they're cut mm. and so i'm thinking about there's this question of pattern and the usefulness of pattern and also the oppressiveness of yeah. pattern both so there's intimacy in the tea table it's the home it's where we gather it's also where all our most entrenched patterns are so what the artwork does is it cuts the head off and ask kind of well how do we get out of the pattern without breaking the vessel we get out of the head mm. the head is detached and the thought bubble is maybe potentially taking us in a new direction mm. then the you, then the pattern that we is you know there's a positive and the negative aspect of the pattern thank you sophia what are you thinking um and i guess i was thinking a little bit about lineage um, and if material demands a form of lineage um, I appreciated hearing about like this connection to your father who created these things um, and how I mean families are a form of repetition right yes. yeah. so <laughs> I'm thinking about how repetition works in in this piece in um, both the familial and like disruptive sense like can a word really be the same word every time it's conjured in a poem because it depends on what it's buttressed with, right? So, yeah, that's what I, it, that didn't really this coalesce into much, but. <laughs> it's it's so much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you're helping us understand the word relationship, which is either a, the relationship of objects or a relationship as in a family, and this is the most Steinian yeah. part, is in fact the precise information that is a difference and a difference that is a relationship, a difference that is a change in the relationship and a change in the relationship produced by its negentropic effect. 
Yeah. <laughs> so that relationship is powerful because there's it is it is to some degree, Jane, a domestic scene with enough opacity to allow all of us to think about our own domestic arrangements, mm. which is what we want art, mm. the art we admire to do for us. Well, thank you for saying so. I also think that it's important that, y y you know, um, was, it, was it you I was listening to talking about visiting a poem that you don't stop talking to it if you don't get on with it? I think it was you. Was, mm. I th it's I'm, a relationship. It's a relationship. Right, yeah. And the idea that, well, you have a continuing relationship even if it's been destructive in your first encounter. Mm. Reader to poem? Uh, reader to poem, but also, I mean, relationships more ge more generally mm -hmm. that, 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 that that's the case, and, and certainly for, for, for poetry and, and art. And I think also what the Steinian um, syntax and rhythm and repetition allows is for this sense of queer accretion that um, we think of when we think of uh, Eve Sedgwick's reparative reading, that you know that you're entering mm -hmm. a process, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that it's up to you, you know, in any relationship, along that line, along those lines, depending on where you enter it, where, where as Virginia Woolf would say, where the accent falls. Mm. Um, so yeah, maybe. Um, mm. Maybe that's it, or that, yeah, I, I, I don't know if I can say any more than that. I, I did want to add that I made a decision in this book, apart from the, the cover and this one image from a letter by my father in this book, that the ekphrasis, I didn't want to have the image next to the poem. Mm -hmm. So in a way, kind of discussing the kind of hinterland to the poem, I hope that you don't need to know anything about the exhibition. So interesting. I think right, right. it absolutely stands alone. But then learning about the artists and the exhibition yeah, adds it's more the, meanings, yeah. but it, it's yeah. without that. It's a kind that. of rippling out. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. the images in the pamphlet also aren't images of the work. They're images of the <coughs> women with the work. Yes. So they capture mm. and document the mm. extraordinary occasion. Mm. Yeah. Let's um, collect final thoughts. Uh, anything at all that either has already been said you want to emphasize or something new. Um, Ian, this is your first this gig like this. I, but I'm going to call on you first. Sure, surely sure, you prefer. have a final thought. So many thoughts. I, I mean, one of the things that I love about um, this poem is how generative it is. Mm. And now that I've got a better understanding of what negentropy is from hearing hearing Jane talk about it, um, I feel like the whole poem is doing that. The whole poem is like a hyping up. It's like you know, it's like being in a crowd at a political rally or something, and these questions are be are being directed at you, and it accelerates towards the end with this contraction, as, as Leanne was saying, into the shortest question. And I feel like at the end of the poem is the beginning of your response. Mm -hmm. And I love that the poem leaves us there. Wonderful. Oh, thank you. Great final Good. thought. Lainey Brown? Uh, I love how this poem has no ending. In other words, it, it multiplies possibilities. It speculates what if, what if, what if, what if. But it doesn't conclude for us. And so in a sense, as you were saying, it's the relationship that we're still in it. It encourages us to not try to have a pat ending or jump to a conclusion or think that we can answer all of the questions, but instead it, it just is ongoing. Lovely. Thank you. I just want to point to the, nobody said anything about the word muddle, is mud, clay. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Muddle, mm. mud, mud, clay. Yeah, Wonderful. body. Thank you. Love that. Sophia? Um, I think my final thought is very similar to both Ian and Laney's, which was, I was thinking, um, like, is an incomplete question uh, an answerable one? Like, there's, what if the majolica plate, but there's no verb. And so I, I, like, that, I like that the action of it is kind of our in interaction with it. Um, and... On a side note, I read this poem as this printout without the context of the art, and then I yeah. and then I saw the art, and um, I I feel like they were different reading experiences, and I thought different things, but both were equally like amplifying what I saw in this and generative for me. So I I just wanted to say that to you. 
Thank you. And actually what you've, you've just clarified for me and learning that, that I had made this difference in it, textual editing of, of the poem, what if the Mayolica plate, then you really get the emphasis on thinking about the politics of the, particularly when the, the rest of the poem or the, the, the final two thirds pushes back against the. Um, yeah, thank, thank you for that. My final thoughts about the last four lines, which move me, and I've been trying to figure out why I'm so moved by it, and I think I'll attempt to say so. And then, Jane, you can offer final thoughts in response to any of the final thoughts. You know, okay, the thank ultimate you. final thought, <laughs> not to put too much pressure on you. Um, what if the Majolica plate is a pot? I always think about motives, motives for writing poetry, motives for, motives for poetry. And I think we may find it here. What if the Miolica, Miolica plate is a pot for a definite purpose, simply formed to cast a speech bubble? If I'm right, and I might not be, at least from my own reading, I am. You can't be right or wrong. Yeah, exactly. It's poetry. So <laughs> if, if, I'm, if I feel good about thinking that my reading of the speech bubble is that it might also refer to what we've just had here as a speech bubble, as a thought, <laughs> as Jane Goldman's thought of the moment, right? If that's the case, then we found a simple purpose, a definite purpose formed to do this thing that I have just done. And it kind of forms a speech bubble. It's its own concreteness mm -hmm. with the bottom of the hook and then the bubble is what's above. And it moves me to think that all these thoughts have led the speaker to finding a definite purpose that's simple. And that muddle, which is the covering over here, is is a peasant's too strong a word. Is this is a simple creation of art, an artist that makes something simple, not an attempt to hide or cover, but to create a mixedness that is an aesthetic value of its own. Bless you for saying that. I would like to um, just add a, a PS to that. One of the other things, and I think maybe it's to do with the context in which it, it now appears in Sex Frastic. In this book, there's a whole section on my um, life living with artists and bohemians mm -hmm. in the 1980s in um, Edinburgh. And with one of the most beautiful and glamorous women it has been my honour to share a flat with, uh, her name was um, Lorraine Dick, and we used to, she was studying history at university at the time, and she's the sister of Louise Dick, who uh, yeah. has a poem dedicated to her in, in the writer's shift. Uh, anyway, she was the most glamorous looking person I've ever met um, over breakfast. She was just gorgeous. Dre she looked like she'd come out of Vogue and we dressed in um, second-hand clothes and she wore diamantes and red lipstick and just always dressed to go to a cocktail party. We had no money but we had the best fun and we used to go to all, you know, our friends were artists and we used to go to um, art shows and drink all the free wine and all the things you do when you're in your <laughs> early 20s. And I'll never forget this old dowager looking across the room at, at Lorraine and her equally beautiful and glamorous um, sister, who was herself an artist, and she said, come over here, John. You must come and meet these two girls. They're so decorative. They're <laughs> so, look at them, they're so decorative. Well, you bet they were decorative. They were absolutely fucking gorgeous. <laughs> but, you know, to think that that, summed them up as if they weren't there with a purpose even if that purpose was utter pleasure <laughs> you know that was you know that you were in the presence of an artist and a historian and a living human being you know and I think mm. you know there's this kind mm. of strange bourgeois attraction to the the peasant uh, kind of Bernard Leach fashion where we can all go into our minimalist kitchens and, and, and uh, I mean, there's a shop down the road uh, you can go to and you can, for 500 pounds, you can buy a jacket that looks like something from Mao's China, yeah. you know, so that people in the new town can, can dress like peasants. And this idea of a utilitarian purposefulness 
to this plain tradition of pottery mm. um, is is problematic. You know, it's decorative. Just admit that because it's going for functionalism, that functionalism brings a beauty. Um, but let's not forget there is a purpose mm. to to decorativeness. To bling. Um, to yeah. bling. Yeah. <laughs> and it's and it's accretive and it's queer and it's um, a life force. And I suppose that's what I would like to say that the speech bubble is. Mm. You need a, a living human throat. Mm. So I would love it if you would in turn read my poem back to me. I think that's a great way to end the conversation. And there are four parts, as has been pointed out, four <coughs> questions. Very Jewish approach to the, to the situation. <laughs> so why don't the four of you read the four parts? One, right. two, three, and you get the honor of reading the short one. Well, the what could you, do you the read questions the title? Or, or, and I'll read the title. Yeah, or I'll could do the questions. I'll could do. I'll could do all the questions. All the, all the what if from the New Yorker plate bits. Oh, you're confusing me. How about <laughs> if I? How about if I sit out and the four of you do oh. it? Okay, I'll do the title. Okay, do the one, title. two, three, four, and that's okay. how we'll go out. And I'll say anybody watching this is going to be, I think, rethinking the poem again as we. There's such a good move to have us suggest that we read it. And I'll say in advance, thank you, Jane, for having us here. Thank you all for coming. You've made my day. And we're You've so happy life. to have you. And Hissy <laughs> is joining us. Hissy, will you Hissy, come out you and take come? a bow? No, she's too Hissy shy. Hissy can read a poem. Making <laughs> Hissy's not likely to read a poem. No, this is very <laughs> quiet and, and, and reticent. And fantastic. <laughs> all right, Lainey, you're number one, and I'll okay. read the title, OK? What If the Majolica Plate by Jane Goldman. What if the Majolica plate that is so firmly set in the wall of the dining room display and is posing itself so self-consciously in the sealed empire of objects glaze as it has to be with opaque tin enamel entirely concealing the color of the clay body, the clay body entirely concealed, is not after all the problem, is not after all the origin of all our tea table oppressions, is not after all the negentropic source of all our woes, the very emblem of infinitely many muddled ways, the very ways that things will always go towards muddle and mixedness. What if a Majolica plate is as such the many muddled ways towards muddle and mixedness and is in fact the precise information that is a difference and a difference that is a relationship, a difference that is a change in the relationship and a change in the relationship produced by its negentropic effect without the necessity of making a final intervention, without the necessity of giving up on tea table thinking a tea table thinking that makes a happiness, a happiness that must make peace into existence. What if the Majolica plate has after all been conceived as a pot for definite purposes and is striving towards a new mixedness of unity and spontaneity and simplicity of form and has in fact made itself as simple in its form as it has to be? and is only as muddle patterned as it has to be, to be itself enduring and full of quiet assurance, emanating itself from myriad vital forces behind a clay body, a clay body that is flowing through the processes of its own making, as glazed as it wants to be, with opaque tin enamel entirely concealing the colors of the clay body, the clay body entirely concealed. What if the Majolica plate is a pot for a definite purpose simply formed to cast a speech bubble? Ian, Sophia, Lainey, happy birthday, Leanne. <laughs> and Jane, thank you so much. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>